We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and this race was boring as hell. Yep. On to the next. Bring me Coda. I'm over yeah. it. Yeah. Let's 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 go to Coda. Let's uh, get through this fall break. But th- this was like this was not the race to bring us to this surprise four weeks off that we have between races. And like nobody, we obviously couldn't entirely predict this. But as we were like literally just saying before we hit record, like last year at Singapore was more of an anomaly than like every race. Honestly, in Singapore is I think exciting. it's our fault. Like I think. And not just us, but, like, everyone. Like, it's so overhyped because of last year. It's the OG night race. Like, it's such a cool race and cool track and cool atmosphere. We're all just overhyping the fact that you can't overtake at Singapore. (laughs) And basically, whatever position you're in after, let's say, one and a half laps, that's where you're ending up. Is the position you stay in. God forbid something happens in the pit lane or there's, you know... A safety car, which there hasn't been. Also, I saw something really random. Not random. Has something to do with this. Off track. It's been like over a hundred and something days since we've had a safety car. Yeah, I, for, I forgot to put this in the rundown. But I have the note here. Hold on. It is um like a hundred and twenty six or something like that, or a hundred and eight or something. I don't have the exact number, number of days, but it's nine races with no safety car. Obviously, we had a virtual safety car to end, you know, the last race. Right. But like for an actual like Burt Mylander deployed safety car, actual car, we haven't had one of those, and this is the longest streak since Monza two thousand four to uh, Imola two thousand and five. So That's yeah, wild. it is. It, it it has been a minute. Like I was, I was honestly just waiting for the safety car to deploy. Like I, and we'll talk about Lando in a right, minute, but te- like I texted or I messaged you and I was like, so where's the safety car? <laughs> like, yeah. When is it coming out or are we not going to have one? And I mean, I was just honestly waiting for, for Lando to do something to cause a crash. Cause, cause that was like the way he was driving the latter half of the race. Um, and I was just like, <laughs> well, and it's like, where's the, the safety car? And the engineers, like to Yuki being like, oh, people are fighting in front of you. Like something could head our way. Like, are you? And he's like, that's too much information. Just like, leave, leave, me, leave me alone. Me alone. <laughs> oh my God. Radio, yeah. I do have to say for such a boring race, the radio calls are pretty funny this weekend. Well, I think that they like have, when, when nothing is happening, like the people in production have to be like, okay, we need to, like, is somebody going to say something good because we don't have anything else to talk about? And Ted Kravitz can only, you know, come in with jokes about how he's related to Lenny Kravitz so many times during a broadcast. And Lenny Kravitz, like, looked steamy. <laughs> like, he was sweating. The humidity Everyone, every was Every time absurd. they panned to, like, someone in the crowd or someone in a pit, in the pit or whatever, in the paddock, like, they were sweating profusely. It looked miserable. And the track was like, what, 39 degrees, which is insane. Yeah, it was something, it was absurd. But to um, to talk about real quick, F1 Academy, their second race, track temperatures was 56 degrees um, Celsius, which is like completely ridiculous. And it was 20, I believe it was 20 degrees hotter than um, the track temperatures for race one. And we'll talk about everything that happened in the F1 Academy later. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was hot. It was gross. Um, you know, no the Mercedes drivers. No night race because like yeah. they can't actually do it during the day or they'll die. Right. Like the Mercedes drivers allegedly, you know, bowed out of media duties because they borderline were having heat stroke and needed to go to the med center instead of talking to the media, which. Which I don't doubt that. Like it was, it was really hot and they all looked like exhausted Awful. Lando got water dumped on him by a presenter at the end of it and I guess Checo like didn't his um like drink wasn't working or his oh like my God, drinking not again. system wasn't working so it's like which I understand it's not like a high priority probably for engineers to make sure that that's working but like how can you just like send a car out there without them being able to drink water like, no, and th- this is not the first time this has happened to him in a high temperature race. I think there was a, a I think there was one year at Cota, like it, 21 or 2022, where I, it was a race that he won. And I can't remember which one it was because it's been so long since Checo's won a good race. Um, but he did not have his drink system because, yeah. you but know, it's happened to it a bunch of them. Like it happened it's, to Charles this year. Normal. It's happened yeah. to like, and it just like doesn't work, which 
I think is absolute insanity, especially for like a really hot race. But yeah, especially a whatever. climate like Singapore, which is just absolutely it's it's one of the most difficult most brutal races on the calendar um and just not always the most exciting i mean not every year can have a race like the race that gave us crashgate which was the no. first year of singapore or you know give us george blowing it you know in hot pursuit of carlos and lando like it did last year yeah um, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I think we overhyped it. And I think the part that makes Singapore interesting, or at least like kind of exciting to watch, is that normally there are a lot of safety cars. And so that really like makes everyone switch up strategy and, you know, the restart and everything like that. So I don't which know. Which we did not have this year. Which we did not have. At so all. I think some of it is our fault for overhyping. But. Yeah, but I mean, but we also ex- like there was no reason not to expect a safety car because there has been a hundred percent. Yeah, but like you never safety hope car. for a safety car. Well, Catherine. no, but we expect that somebody's gonna like put it in a wall or spin or That's you know fair. somebody somebody crashes you know after doing a dive bomb on lap one. Franco Colapinto, but we loved it because it was one of like the three exciting things that happened during so the race. But anyway, before we go into that. And before we go into everything, I want to point out number one, um, I, I only discovered this today or only realized this today, but I did not know that the official Singapore Grand Prix Instagram handle is just F1 Night Race. And I think that's awesome. It's the OG Night Race. It they, is. They've claimed it. They, sure. they 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 fully have, but I just I saw that because um, um, I was looking through Susie Wolf's Instagram stories for the F1 Academy weekend stuff, and she had tagged Formula One and the Singapore Grand Prix. I was like, it, is that real? And it was like, oh, it is. So yeah. that was something that I noticed. Also, this is completely unrelated, but I feel like I need to address the elephant in the room. I have switched up my allegiance. <laughs> I am now bandwagon McLaren fan. Basically, just because I thought the sweatshirt was cool as shit. You can get it at Abercrombie in the men's section. Super comfy, really cool. And it, like, goes all over. Um, that is really cool. also, I'm just, like, team, let's make sure Red Bull doesn't win the, the, the Constructors' Championship. So well, they're I'm not going so ahead. you're good. Full steam ahead, McLaren. Also, I just really love Oscar. I think Oscar is just so great. Can't wait for him yeah. to be world champion, like, next year. So Yeah, no, Oscar <laughs> <we> is... <laughs> Oscar's just been driving so well, and I think he did um, have one of the best performances. But before we get to talking oh, wait. about all of before the performances... Before we talk to something else, I do want to confirm something else. For those of you who have been with us since the beginning, I have yet to buy the $800 Ferrari white-on-white <laughs> sweatshirt, and I think my, like, $60 McLaren one is is the move, so... I just don't think I can keep my allegiance to Ferrari. I'm going to be completely honest. <laughs> I mean, next year is going to be really interesting. I'm losing hope, but I'm losing steam. And I think next year I'm like full on McLaren Williams. I'll split my I'll split my time between the two, but and wherever Franco Colapinto goes, because I'm his number one fan. So. Yeah, we'll have like weekly Franco Colapinto <laughs> updates until he gets back to the F1 <gasps> Where grid. Where the world is Franco <laughs> Colapinto? It'll be a series that we do. Yeah. And speaking oh. of Franco and where in the world he will be I in the 2025 know. season, news has broken this week that Valtteri Botas is allegedly going to be signing a one-year extension with Stake, which is actually something that I kind of called months ago when we've been talking about potential, yeah. you know, signings and where people would go and, you know, the idea that Audi wants to figure out who their driver lineup is and giving Botas just a one year to get from stake to Audi. And then they would figure out who their second Audi driver is going to be alongside Nico Hulkenberg. So he's allegedly signing a one-year extension. Franco Colapinto and Gabriel Bortoletto from F2 were both kind of sort of in consideration, but apparently talks didn't go very far. It's not entirely a surprise. Like it would be no. great to see Franco in the seat, but Botas is A, a proven driver and B, is already in the car so it yeah but like really franco already point. has more points than botas this season so <laughs> everybody has sure. more points than botas this um, weekend I this mean, season as much as i was like pushing for joe i think when we did like our recap of where seats are i was like botas makes sense it's probably what they're gonna do however i don't want to see him in a seat i don't know why i just like don't enjoy him being on the grid i just i don't know it uh, who cares about my opinion? But I would much rather see like Joe or Franco in the seat. I think it makes it more entertaining. Like I've said this a million times, I think Botas is towards the end of his career and kind of just like tapering off and, you know, 
his his time with F1 is sunsetting. And I think next year, his one-year extension, if it actually goes through, will be his last year in F1. Like, I don't see him getting a seat after that. And it gives, you know, Audi and a whole nother year to look at drivers. We had a ton of contracts up this year. We have some, like a handful next year, but there's also rookies or other people that can always move to Audi. So... And we never know who's going to retire after 2025 either. Right. A, that could be that could be Botas. It could be Fernando. It could be, you know, it could be Max. Max could be done after this year based on, you know, everything. And we'll talk about, you know, what's, what's been going on with him in a minute. But yeah, it's, you know, I think that he, they, they said that he's aiming to try to get like a one-in-one so that he does get to, to Audi. But I think at with the way that stake has been and the way that like he hasn't been driving that car all that great because the car is really bad um, and he's not even out driving the car. If he wants to stay on the F1 grid, he might as well take the one year. Yeah. In my total I mean, non-professional, you know, backseat quarterback. Opinion. Like a, a one-in-one literally is no skin off Audi's back though because like if he sucks the first year like they just drop him they're they're like a one-in-one I hate when people are like oh it's a two-year contract well it's not it's a one-in-one you get one year guaranteed the option for another year which means absolutely nothing and it's basically a one-year contract yeah, exactly. Um, and then a uh, side note of contracts, apparently Christian Horner is using the Uno reverse card with Toto Wolf's like, we're going ham on trying to sign Max Verstappen. And Christian Horner is like, well, you know, George Russell is out of a contract <laughs> after 2025. And so we would be crazy not to consider him either. Honestly, get the carts out. Like, I want to see this handled on the track. Put them in carts in Vegas. Like, I want this to happen. I know, like, everyone was talking about it and, like, bullshitting about it, but... Do it. Zach Brown, Toto Wolf, Christian Horner, put them in James cars. Vals. James Vals. Oh, and let's throw Susie in there because I'm sure she'd yeah. kick all of their asses, honestly. Like, yeah. I want to see it. Put them all in cars. Let's let's handle this like professionals. But to what Christian was saying, he's like, I mean, his contract will be up and he's a really good driver. Like, we can't just write it off because he's a Mercedes driver. Like, we're going right. to look at all the best drivers who will be available. So it's not necessarily saying like, Toto, I'm going after George. I think it was just a very blanket statement of like anyone who has contracts coming up, if they're a top driver, obviously we're going to consider them because we want to be a top team. Right. I just thought it was funny because we've had, you know, Toto going on and on and on about Max all year long. I think he just does it to like get at Christian. Oh, absolutely. Like, well, he, and he kind of basically admitted that when he, when, with the announcement of Kimi Antonelli signing with Mercedes of like, we knew that Antonelli was going to replace, uh, replace Lewis like five seconds after Lewis announced, excuse me, to Ferrari. And so he's just, you know, they're just screwing with people, but yeah, it, we, (laughs) as we keep talking about the future of formula one contracts, the driver lineups, very interesting. We don't know. We never talk about 2024 when we can talk about 2025 and beyond. Exactly. But the funny thing is, like, this season is so much more entertaining than last season. <laughs> that is also but, true. But, like, all yeah. we're doing is talking about next season. But, yeah. Okay. I want to just get through this really quickly because it's so painful to talk about. But yeah. we had a race. Lando won his third race of the season. Max got P2. And then Oscar was P3. So, honestly... I didn't see Lando the entire race because he won by like a million bajillion seconds and he was way in front and good for him. He started on pole. He won first time in his career. He's ever done that. Yeah. Don't want to take anything away from him, but like, I don't know how he raced because I never saw it and I really don't care because he won by a ton. It wasn't a close race. I will say he, while it was not a close race, I did think that at the, after like the first half of the race, he did kind of do everything possible to make it interesting because he did hit the wall a couple of times as, uh, you know, as he was going. Um, And part of that they they kind of talked about on the broadcast was just like, they're exhausted. Like this is a very difficult challenge. So like, obviously he wasn't trying to make it interesting on purpose. It's not like he's going for pit stop practice like like, Max would when he's up 30 seconds. Everyone hits the wall in Singapore. It, like, and wasn't... he hits the wall multiple times. Yeah, but like so did Franco and so did Checo and I don't know. Lewis well, I think something. the caliber of, of, of racing between Franco and, and Lando is completely different. But I don't yeah, disagree. I know, everybody does brush everyone the wall. Hit, everyone hits the wall. Not everyone like hits the wall like Carlos or George, but yeah. um, you know, it happens. Yes. 
So Max so, podium, Max. which is exciting for him because the, I, Singapore is and will always be his white whale. I don't think he can like actually get himself to retire until he win, wins in Singapore. It's like the what the only one on the it calendar is the, that he hasn't yeah, won. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we haven't seen him on the podium in a hot minute since Zandvoort, which is three races ago. But it feels yeah. like a hot minute. <laughs> well, but still, three races for Max not to be on podium like that. It's been, what, four years since that's happened? Yeah, no, you're not wrong. Um, And then what I thought was really interesting is, like, looking back to, like, the last time, because he's only podiumed in Singapore three times in his career, and the last two were 2018 and 2019. The, f- the last time he finished P2 was 2018. 2019 was a P3. Um, but this, it is it is exactly what he needed for the uh, the driver's championship battle with Lando. Uh, but it also um, really goes to show you how important it is to qualify well in Singapore because he not, and had an Oscar not qualified where he was, it could very well have been a, a one-two finish for McLaren. Yeah, easily. Easily. But he's what 52 points up on Lando Mm -hmm. so we only have a handful of races left we'll see I mean I think as much as I want Lando to win again team McLaren bandwagon um, jumper bandwagon I am a bandwagon papaya and I am so proud to be to be here I don't know I just I want him to win but I just I think Max will will end up winning well, I don't want Lando to win, but they have it, it mathematically. It's worked out. A Checo, who I think is eighth in the drivers' championship, he is no longer eligible to win the championship mathematically. Ooh, sorry. Shocking! <laughs> but Max, um, he can finish P two in every race and every sprint, and still win the championship over Lando at this point. So he technically does not need to win the race anymore. He can finish P two from here on out. As the Red Bull Max Verstappen fan, I would like to see him win again. But, right, but like, you know. what if we get four DNFs from Max? You know what I mean? Well, that's a completely different situation, but I'm saying, yeah. like, you know, he doesn't have for his best performance only needs to be P2 right now, which obviously he's not happy with that. That's but... still pretty high, though, considering how he's done the last four races. Yeah, and it's also, it, like, I, I've said this before, but this is very similar to the situation that Jensen Button was in when he was driving for Braun in 2009, which we talked about in uh, the reaction to the Hulu Braun documentary. Yeah. So yeah, great. Max landed on the podium. Fine. Yeah. I don't. I want to talk about Max versus the FIA yeah. for a hot minute. So, if you live under under a rock, you know. Let's recap this for you. Basically, Max used bad, naughty language in an FIA press conference and was slapped with community service. <laughs> for I, I want to. I want to cut in really quick (laughs) and I want to point out like the timing of this is really kind of funny because the FIA president who was no one's favorite person, Mohammed, Mohammed Ben Salam, he said prior to all of this happening, which I think gets lost in the shuffle of all of this is that prior to what Max said in the driver's press conference, he said that he didn't want drivers to swear because they're not rappers or something about like comparing drivers to rappers. And I don't know what brought this on or why they decided that this weekend was the hill that this was supposed to die on. Obviously, Lewis Hamilton, as a person of color, was rightfully offended because racism, and this is not the first time that the FIA president has done a a little bit of a racist. But... I just thought it was funny that, like, he started that, and then this all continued and happened. Yeah, I think it was just, like, him trying to prove a point. But, like, and every driver who's talked about this has made the same argument. And it's, like, we are high-level competitive athletes in the very stressful, crazy moments, lots of adrenaline. Like, yeah, we're going to say a bad word here and there. Like, Every other athlete at high stakes opportunities and games or matches or whatever, they're just not mic'd up. So like, yeah, this isn't exactly. a thing that's unique to us 20 people sitting in this seat. Like we just have a microphone on us constantly yeah this, like, this is the only like sport it, don't where, air it on the broadcast this yeah this is literally the only sport where drivers are mic'd up 100 of the time 100 of the field like this is you know you don't have that in basketball in the nfl in baseball where they have, like they're mic'd up moments where they're mic'd for like an inning or a set of downs or whatever but yeah one they know they're mic'd and they know it's gonna be on and they can kind of like 
you know, they do it when it's not super intense moments either. But F1 drivers have to be mic'd up. They have to be able to communicate with their engineers. Like, it's the only way that they can talk. And so, again, if you don't like what they're saying, don't air it on the broadcast. And yeah. FIA and F1, you guys control what's on the broadcast. So, like, don't you think it's a little bit your fault, too, if people are offended or they're upset about the language? Yeah, exactly. And so what Max said in the press conference is he, you know, somebody asked him about the car in Baku and he said it was effed. And so the FIA responded by summoning him to the stewards with this long ass brief about how he needs to do work of public interest, aka community service with Lewis Hamilton basically said, if I was Max, I wouldn't do it. Um, and, and everyone's making a joke of it too. Because it is a joke. And like, like, yes, it's a breach of the sporting code, which like, and no, you're not supposed to, you know, say the F word in, in a, you know, in a professional press conference, Toto Wolf and Fred Vassour both got penalized or slapped on the wrist for it last year with everything that was happening in Vegas. But this is not the hill to die on. It's not. No, it's not. And like, I mean, even like Danny got asked a question. He, he's like, mm, well, I don't want community service, so I'm not going to say anything That's else. Not say. And I'm like, like, everyone's making jokes of it. I think it's really stupid. I think they almost are picking on Max because Max is Max and like they're going to make an example out of him. Right. But like, take a look at who uses what language. Like, yeah, they all swear a ton. Like, what, what about Yuki? Yeah, like, exactly. Can we please use him as the example? Because, like, he's a little firecracker and just dropping F bombs left and right. Yeah. I, just, I think this is so dumb, so wildly dumb. And if they don't, like, I just, I can't. And also, I know Kevin Magnuson. And not in the car, but still, like. No, no, I don't, I don't disagree. Like, Kevin Magnuson even said to reporters, and obviously, this was not in the official FIA press conference, which is that, that's where the problem is. But K Mag said this weekend that he was ready to fuck shit up. Like, that I know, is a exactly. quote from Kevin Magnuson to that the media. That's a quote. Yeah. I, just, ugh, I can't. Yeah, so I also I want to I want to also add that this used to, this, as I said this is a breach in the sporting code. It used to be penalized by a fine, but the FIA, like I said, in their infinite wisdom, has decided that this is something that needs that is their hell to die on, and so they've decided that it needs to be escalated. But like, this isn't something that you know is for cause of community service. What's he going to do? Pick up trash in the stands like like Seb Vettel used to do in Japan after races, which like that's just that's just who Sebastian Vettel is. You don't have to make him do community service. That's his life. Like it's it's not this is this is not like the F, nobody likes the FIA. And this is not making the FIA look any better. Like this isn't going to suddenly make me look at Formula 1 and be like, "Oh yeah, Formula 1 is even better now that the FIA is crap Backing down on swear words. Yeah. I just, I think this is the dumbest witch hunt. Yeah. And even Max, who like, we know Max does not care about the longevity of his F1 career. He's like, he's not going to be doing 400 races. This was, this was Lewis Hamilton's 350th race start today. Like Max isn't going to do that. And, you know, he said, you know, Formula One's going to move on without me. And, you know, whether I'm here or not, it doesn't matter. And like, I don't, care enough to you know want to deal with this nonsense if I don't have to deal with it right and like they the FIA is like how we're gonna stick it to Max and give him community service well then guess what you get out of Max at you don't get Max anymore it's one word answers non-answers or just like him ignoring and being short and like excuse my French being an asshole but like in a funny way he's like you think (laughs) that you can do this but then like I'm not gonna say anything because like what if something I say something that you don't like I don't know I just I think the FIA controls so much of their lives on race weekends that they get to be in a press conference and answer questions honestly and they're like oh no we're actually gonna control how you do that too so they're, they're gonna lose lose it yeah, and I mean, this do you want? Battle. Do you not want Max Verstappen on, you know, driving in Formula One anymore? Like he is such a financial draw to Formula One that you know you lose him, you let, lose out on the basically the entirety of the fan base at Zandvoort, and then you have you know nobody nobody's going to give a, a fuck about going to Zandvoort anymore. But I also want to say, know if that's true. not I mean, entirely. I, I would go to Zandvoort even if Max wasn't on the grid, <laughs> but. 
you know, a lot of the draw to Xanbor is Max. Um, and I also want to add that, you know, Max, when he was doing all of his one word answers, which I thought was, you know, a, a great stand to make against the FIA in that press conference, he did say to the reporters, like, I'll talk to you outside. And then he did. So yeah. he had he had a full on Max Verstappen podcast pre press conference outside after the post qualifying. Press but again, conference. it's like that's the FIA, like F1 post race press conference in the building official everything like right they're gonna lose out on that because how many like yes they're required to go but they don't have to talk to you so you're gonna lose all of that ex exclusivity and all of that specialness because you guys are being dicks yeah Right. You know what, honestly, the, the way the FIA is reacting kind of reminds me of how um, the, the FIA versus Lewis Hamilton, when they were cracking down on jewelry, uh, like drivers and jewelry, <laughs> where, yeah, where, where Lewis had like 14 nose piercings, like six watches, 18 necklaces, <laughs> just like to make a point. Do you remember that? Yeah, because he kept, because he has his nose pierced and he, like, they force him to take it out, but he's like, if I take it like take it out, put it back in, take it out, put it back in. It's going to get infected. He had a doctor like write up this whole spiel about it. Yeah. And, but like, he was like given so many warnings. So he like shows up to the official press conference, just completely blinged out all of the watches up his arm, every chain. He yeah. Could oh my God. And it's just like, but that's the thing too. These drivers are funny and they have personalities and like, yeah. You hit me, I'll hit you back. Like, that is the mentality, which I love. But and just, like, anyways. let them, like, that's the draw to Formula One is, like, Valtteri Botas is weird. Max is an asshole. Lewis Hamilton is Lewis Hamilton. Like, that's that's the point. And, like, we don't want, like, a cookie-cutter boring. vanilla cookie-cutter, you know, drivers. Exactly. Like, what's the fun in that? We could watch yeah. another sport. But. Anyways, yeah, okay, exactly. Anyway, Have we talked enough about our, our hatred of the FIA uh, press conferences. We we have, we have we have definitely hammered home just how dumb this hill is that the FIA is dying on, and it'll be interesting to see if anything comes of this. Obviously, like the jewelry thing has waved away. I think this will too. You know, Max this might is be a losing testy battle. with the media. It's it's a losing battle like, for the it's FIA. It's so easy for the for like the f word to just fly like accidentally i say that, it all the time yeah so do i and i don't even realize it so anyways yeah okay oh, speaking of not realizing it before we move on really quickly one of the excuses that they used is um and this has been used by drivers before is that um you know Ma max says it's like common language it's not you know english is not his first language and so right. the excuse that has that he has used and that has been used before is like this is not language like i i don't know the full context like yuki sonoda used this um when when you yuki said a, a bad thing earlier this season so this is so that was one of the the reasonings and it's just like i mean it, like i i get it you don't want a six-year-old to hear hear the fork word i said the fork word the first time when i was six and i got yelled at quite unfairly for having no knowledge of what that word meant um sorry dad but it's the word is going to be said, it's going to be heard. And, at, you know, it's not like the broadcast doesn't bleep out curse words. And Except for I, the cool down room. The cool down room doesn't count. And I love right. the cool down but room. But no, and like, I think it was on season like two or three of Drive to Survive or whatever. But Christian Horner was saying how like everyone jokes about Yuki dropping F-bombs left and right. But like he learned his English from mechanics from mechanics and like in the garage and like you know i think they're like they're in england but like wherever he was and their like training program or whatever like outside of london so like it's a really thick accent and they have slang and like that's where he learned his english and so he's yeah. like when he says the f word in between words like that's how he thinks it should be because yeah. that's how he learned it and like to each their own i learning a language is hard it is what it is yeah but. exactly so anyway that is max versus the fia now let's talk about oscar for 30 seconds because i do think that oscar had one of the best drives of the day that we just didn't see yeah i mean i don't know i i couldn't tell you he wasn't on the broadcast right he you know got past the mercedes and he ended up on the podium like that's literally all i have to say about him
Yeah, the, the the McLaren strategy of, you know, making sure that the, the difference in the age of tires between Oscar's car, because he did pit later, and the Mercedes cars was what allowed, ultimately what allowed him to overtake, to make it onto the podium, because like that's the only way that you can overtake on this track unless you manage to overtake through the pit lane. And yeah, it was, it was very underrepresented. Uh, and also we forgot to mention, but McLaren had their special legend reborn, you know, retro livery, which looked fine. But yeah, it's, that was, I, I do think it was one of the better drives that was just not spotlighted on the broadcast at all. Yeah. But you know who was spotlighted? Yes. Franco Colapinto. Our boy, My Franco Colapinto. Our boy, Franco. Um, Love him so obsessed i love how the presenters are also obsessed with him and they're like he's so good and even he had a shout out from checo he's like he's really good and he's really hard to pass I'm yeah like, you suck checo but no it's really exciting he didn't get a point this weekend but that's fine i think this is a really hard race and he was p11 so it's not like he was p20 um i still think it was such a good move to switch him in for logan Sargent. he's yeah. 11th is the lowest he's um placed he's finished ever he's finished yeah. ever which is like that's higher than logan ever did all season maybe besides coda for the like honorary point that he got in p10 like what he hasn't really done much so i think franco's really showing himself as a good driver and he should continue to have a seat in the future so hopefully something yeah happens there I, I i don't disagree um also ugh, this is like the only thing that i care about this weekend is daniel ricardo so yeah. good old danny rick i think this was his last drive in f1 which is really depressing um he didn't have a great race also although i would say like strategy was rough like he pitted way earlier than everybody else and he didn't qualify well it was just overall a hard weekend but he still get he still got driver of the day and he stole uh fastest lap. So that helped out Max and, and Christian made sure that Max knew it was Danny, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. Um, I think that the only reason why Danny got driver of the day is they showed what the numbers were like five laps before voting was supposed to close and they because they had been talking all race about how this could be Danny's last you know last race blah 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 um and then all of a sudden people are like oh well screw Lando being driver of the day yeah. every week this should this should go to Danny and then yeah. it did um which I think is fine and yeah, yeah so like all all of the hoopla and the rumors are flying that it'll be announced he's you know being replaced by Liam Lawson which yeah We've talked about for next season, not a mid-season switch. I personally did not see the mid-season switch, but if they've decided to go ahead and like say Liam's going to be our driver for next season, Danny's not really doing anything. Like it doesn't hurt us to just switch him in the car. You, Daniel, you know what I? You know what I think? I think this has everything to do with Franco, and I think had Williams not decided to trade out Sergeant for Colapinto and you know Colapinto showed that that was a good decision I think had that not happened and had Williams decided to stick with Sergeant through the rest of the year and then let him go then we would have a completely different conversation because I and I think that they're looking at what Colapinto is doing and saying oh well we remember how Lawson did last season we Just might as well put him in, in the there car. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's hard to say, like, oh, well, they did it, so we can do it, too. Like, it's a completely different situation. I mean, Danny's not causing millions of dollars of damage True. every weekend or, like, preventing him from even racing. So, yeah. and again, it's a, well, he's not coming back. We signed Carlos. As soon as that came out, it's like, oh, we're also replacing Sargent because, like, we don't need to keep him around. It means nothing right. if he keeps driving. So, t I think the same thing happened. But like different logic of they've decided to put Lawson in the car next year. It's no skin off their back to take Danny out and put him in to get him some extra laps and, and races under his belt before he's like a full-time member or full-time driver next year. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I still do think that there was a little bit of like, let's see how Cole Pinto does for a couple of weeks and then we'll make our decision. Now, obviously, everybody's been hemming and hawing and, you know, I, I hate it when Ralph Schumacher says things and they turn out to be right. I but know. This, this that looks like it's to, happening. Like, eat a sock and I, not a clean one. I, 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 I need, him. I need, like, whether or not he, he's right about this, I need Ralph Schumacher to just go away. But this also is bringing up some questions about the, you know, collusion between Red Bull and V-Carb and the blurred lines between, you know, teams who are owned by the same entity and how, you know, different things are. And McLaren has never been a fan of the existence of Toro Rosso, Alphatari, V-Carb. And they're like, we want an investigation, even though, you know, they're uh, like, it was officially not a directive from Red Bull. Laurent Mecki is the team principal at V-Carb said they wanted him to savor his last race and, in, in, you know, in, with a, you know, happy memories and go out with fastest lap, which is completely reasonable. And yes, also happens to help Danny's friend and former teammate in his championship battle at the same time. And so, also stick it to McLaren. And, and also stick it. <laughs> yeah, also stick it to McLaren. Da- Danny said, like, if this works out and Max wins by one point, then I think I'm going to get myself a really nice Christmas present present from Max, which fair. And also, like you said, you know, there's nothing that Danny's going to want more than to stick it to McLaren after everything that McLaren put him through. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, I think we'll talk more about Danny during the fall break and we'll figure out what's happening in his direction and everything like that. I don't, I mean, I could see him sticking around and being a reserve driver for Red Bull and when Checo inevitably messes up next season, maybe jumping into that seat, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, that, to 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 also add in the the Checo Perez layer. Yes, he signed a two year contract. No, we don't believe it's worth the paper it was signed on. So it's the the door is not entirely closed for Daniel, even though it's looking like this might be the end of it. And obviously, he had a very you know emotional you know few moments in the media pen. The if you look at the his his interview with Sky, he's like, yeah, you know, didn't get the fairy tale ending, but I'm happy with you know what happened. And I think you know it's. Hit him, you know, going to, to V carb and, and having his time at V carb is definitely better way to go out than, you know, being kicked out and given an, an alleged $18 million paycheck and saying, we like this eight, you know, this, this 20 year old kid better than you. Yeah. Or however old Oscar is, but yep. clearly it worked out for, for McLaren. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, I mean, we can, I just want to do a light graze over this. I couldn't even tell you that there was a fourth DRS zone. It made literally no, one no could. difference because it's yeah. Singapore. And then something else, like, I guess we can graze over is Ferrari. Like, it, this, they're a perfect example of why you need to qualify well at Singapore. Also, right. like, it's just like Monaco. You have to qualify well at Monaco. Qualifying pretty much sets how you finish. Um, and they didn't qualify well. They qualified ninth and 10th, and it was terrible, and they didn't do well, so... Yeah. And also they got held up by Nico Hulkenberg, who at one point was driving, like he was in P5 at one point. He was in P3 at one point because everyone was like all over the place with pitting. And I'm like, this is hilarious because Hulk will forever be the guy who raced forever and never got a podium. And it's, it's still not going to be today. So yeah, exactly. And it, and it wasn't also really quick. Anybody who started the race on a soft tire or, or who didn't, who like tried to do an actual stint on a soft tire, like that also was disappointing because that tire did not work. Lewis was no. not a happy man. Danny had a, a, he had a full stint on a, on a soft tire and it just like, it it did not work out well at all. And it was definitely like the the alternative alternative tire strategy. And I I think it was really I don't know who came up with that idea, but maybe they shouldn't be doing tire strategies. Well, I think for they, Singapore, I think it's it's just a Pirelli issue in general. Like all the softs were different and not the same. Like they between free practices and quali, like the car was different and I think we're really struggling with Pirelli tires this year. That's what it sounds yeah. like at least. That's that's a there's whole no other... consistency and I think that that was the that was the big issue. That's weekend, a whole I other think. can of worms. <laughs> Dinner time for Bishop. Check. It's been a while since we've had one of those. But yeah, George Russell uh, has made some comments. Pirelli's gotten upset, but yeah, it it's the 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 tire situation has has been very interesting this season. 
but it's kind of one of the, and, and the, oh, here, the other thing that it impacts it is this is a night race. So the tire temperatures are going to be a significantly different than they are in practice one and practice three. And those are two full hours of, or pra- yeah, practice one and three. And those are two full hours of practice sessions that are in the day, whereas you only have practice two, which is representative of what you're going to see at night. And then, you know, cause qualifying is qualifying. Yeah. So, all right. I think it's time for us to get into our predictions. I have nothing else to say about the race weekend. I have one one more thing before we oh do. Uh, just really quick, the uh, Mercedes special Petronas livery made it look like an Aston Martin, so it was very difficult to figure out which car was which on the track. Oh, no one could figure out who was who this weekend. Like Not the presenters all. did such a bad job. It's, they were saying like Lando, and it was Oscar, and they were saying Stroll, and it was um. Alonzo and yeah it was just they were all over the place so it was yeah horrible um okay speaking of horrible our predictions our predictions we sucked so Paul was Lando you had Charles I had Oscar so we both Mm -hmm. lost their podium was Lando Max Oscar we were not even close no you had Oscar Charles Lando I had Oscar Charles Carlos lol um and then P10 Good buddy Checo still, you know, throwing in his hat to get some points. Um, you had Danny, I had Hulk. I was not far off though. No, you like, weren't. He wasn't. Like he was. That. He was in. He was in P nine, and I would have taken Colapinto in P eleven as you know P ten any day. Yeah. Um, and then biggest surprise, you said that Max would podium, which he did. I said it was going to be a double Williams didn't see points, that coming. and they didn't get any points. Albon no. DNF'd. He retired the car early, and then Franco was eleven. Who's going to do a dumb? We both said Lando, um, but obviously he won. He won the race by a lot. He did well, nope. so. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, oh my gosh. We have talked a lot. So let's get into our F1 Academy update. So it was an F1 Academy weekend we told you guys about. So our girl Susie was there, which is so exciting. Love to see her there. So Catherine, give us a quick f1 academy update from this weekend yeah so first of all remember how we talked in the predictions about how red bull canceled their special livery yes well they didn't actually cancel it entirely because it was still in hamda al Kobasi's car because oh, cool. um, she is a red bull driver and so if you watched that race you saw it it was very fun black and white graphic it was actually it actually for once looked like a cool alternate livery but you could only see it on the f1 academy car and hamda didn't have a, a bad weekend which the the Red Bull, all three Red Bull cars haven't been doing great this season in F1 Academy. They're all in MP Motorsport and they're all currently in P5, but we'll talk about constructors in a second. Both podiums for both races were the standard Abby pulling one. Maya Vug finished in P2 and Dorian Pond finished in P5. But I want to highlight, highlight Leah Block, who's the American driver for Williams. She had her best weekend of the season by far. She had two P4 finishes, which has put her up into, P2, uh, into the top 10 in the drive standings I believe she's an eighth and she was almost she's like on the cusp of a podium finish um in race one because Pawn um had her second jump start penalty she had a, a jump start um earlier on the season so she had five seconds and um Block was only like 4.8 seconds behind. And then all of a sudden on that last lap, uh, Pond pulled out this like phenomenal final lap. She took four tenths off pulling's best, you know, race time to maintain that five seconds and keep her podium. But it's, it's really showing like Leah Block either really loves Singapore or she's really finding her footing in single seater, which is really exciting. Yeah. So that's our, our um, podium. But then, well, and P4, I guess, with uh, yeah. with Leah. But we talked a little bit about the wild card because there didn't they. So for this race, there wasn't a wild card from the host country. The wild card was Ella Lloyd from England. So how did she do? Yeah, this she weekend? she actually had a pretty pretty solid weekend. She finished P9 in race one, but she also had a false start penalty. She would have finished P7, which is where mm. she finished in the second race. But she and Nina Gaidman from um, Zandvoort are the only wildcard drivers to score points this season. So that's a really solid footing. And then just looking at the number of 
for um, Formula One Academy racers who are in their second season, it's like two thirds of the grid. So they're going to have to like fill those in because you can only be in F1 Academy for two years. So Edmund and Lloyd both have really great opportunities to move up into F1 Academy next year if they want to, because there's going to be plenty of space for them. Yeah, no, that's super exciting. Okay, yeah. so after two races this weekend, where does that put us in driver's standings and also constructors? Was there any movement or are we, are we there was act- There was actually a little bit of movement. I mean, you know, P1, P2, pulling and pawn are pretty much locked in. Pulling is in the driver's seat. She has, you know, it, it's her championship to lose at this point. And it would take a lot for Pawn to, you know, overtake her even with four races left. Any time there, there's about... 214 points, if I did my math correctly, left up for grabs throughout the rest of this season. And so is it possible for for Pawn to overtake pulling in the standings? Yes. Do I think it's going to be happening with the way pulling has been driving? I think it would be very difficult. And then um, Vug, she had two P2 finishes, which moved her up to P3 um, with 12 points uh, behind Han, um, and she is 17 points up on Chloe Chambers, who had been in P3. She's now in P4, two points ahead of Nerea Marti, the Tommy Hilfiger driver. So the the top five are really tight, um, and we can definitely, you know, still see some movement. And I just, I continue to love the fact that the best Haas driver is in F1 Academy. I agree. I think it's great. Yeah, it's it's my it's my favorite. From a constructor's standpoint, Prema and Roden have flip flopped just like they did last race. Oh, uh, Which I there's... think we'll continue to kind of see. Oh, the fully. constructors with so many points available. I think this one it'll be honestly to the very last race. Yeah, the only thing that I think won't change unless something completely wild happens is compost i think that they're kind of in no man's land where they are right now yeah but there's only seven points between prema and Roden, and there's only six points between art uh grand prix and mp motorsport so there's really you know we will see the you know one and two and four and five move but i really don't think we're gonna see anybody either catch compost and i don't think compost is gonna really be able to break into the top two unless like the Prima drivers stop driving and the compost drivers start sweeping podiums. Like it, it would be, it would be that difficult for them to, to make those moves. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, F1 Academy will leave us for a little bit. Our next race with them as a supporting race will be in Qatar. So that's like end of November, December 1st. Yeah, so that that one, we're not going to see them for a little while and then we'll see them the last two races of the season. I also eventually want to talk about my issues with qualifying because I think that We've we've talked a lot, and I also know that you're tired and you're going on a business trip, so we're not going to talk about it today. But I do have an issue with F1 Academy's qualifying process, and I don't like it, and I think that they should change it. Which I think is funny, because earlier when we were talking about how we're going to fix sprint racing, we were like, why don't we just look at F1 <laughs> Academy, what they're doing? So you're flip-flopping on yourself now. Well, in, in this well, in this case, for how they qualify, because what they do is that your your best time is your grid for um the, the first one. race, and then your second best yeah. time is the grid for race two. And it's just it really hasn't given like a disparity in the grids because the grids this this weekend were basically the same except for like yeah. a couple, you know, flip-flop changes. And that like Instead of, you know, Vug started P2 in one race, she started P3 in the other and, you know, Pawn 53 in the first race and P2 in the other. So it's it's really, it's not giving us the same difference that we had when, like, compared to last year when we had a reverse grid for race two, which, not perfect, but I think that they have to find something different for next season. Yeah. Oh, and I just brought up sprint races and we've been, like, so without sprint races for a while, but and next we're kind of sprint race. race. Sprint race, yep. So... <gasps> All right. Well, we'll get there when we get there. Again, only only talking about things in the future. Yep. Um, but for Singapore, I mean, I I want to lean towards saying it was a letdown, but I feel like this is what it is a typical Singaporean Grand Prix, so I can't be too upset about it. But I love this race, regardless of how you know boring this weekend was. I I love Singapore. 
Yeah, I do. I do too. It's it's still one of the cornerstone races of Formula One, even though, you know, there were all these memes about it being like Monaco in disguise. The, the one thing that I want, I know I'm not going to get this next year, is I would really appreciate if Formula One did not schedule Baku and Singapore as back to back races, because that's a 4am start and a 5am start for me. And I am tired. So I there's going to be two, there's going to be a week in between races next season on on the calendar but in 2026 maybe we can have like a race in between where i have to wake up at 6 a.m instead of 4 a.m just no. just a thought it, no because we're like doing it. this like it's the regionalization i regionalizing. know except the one that i will never ever canada ever yes canada <laughs> canada next year is so weird It's like we're in Saudi Arabia, then we pit stop in Miami, then we go to Italy and Monaco and Spain, Canada, Canada. Austria. (laughs) Like, I just don't, whatever, it is what it is. Anyway, Um, that's my my one thought about Singapore that I haven't already said. Well, to continue kind of going off track, I want to talk about my off track moment of the weekend, because I thought it was so funny. And also, I love how we're just like accumulating track mascots let's say mm-hmm. um canada has its groundhogs groundhogs and, and geese. cats and you know wherever oh, emily cat i miss emily I know, cat emily cat but singapore's got a lizard and man this little guy can scamper so if you didn't see on the track this weekend they had to like pause because there's a lizard on the track and he just kept like waddling down and the presenters are like look at those back legs go <laughs> but he was just going and then you know the marshals had to get him and they eventually did but never a dull moment when animals are involved um so that is my off track moment of the weekend yeah the, the lizard, even though I, it was on track but it's like track adjacent track, track adjacent i love yep yeah, yep yeah. no it's so good it's so good oh <laughs> all right well up next we have our pseudo second break of the season which we have dubbed the f1 fall break not summer break it is fall break even though it doesn't feel like fall it was like 97 degrees today today's the first official day of fall and i'm beside myself i'm in arizona it's or yesterday still, was the first like, official day of it's fall. it's going back to triple digits here in arizona this week it's for a few days insanity. and i am so annoyed because it's been relatively pleasant and i don't want to go back into triple digits it's too damn hot it's insane um but if anything happens with seats or anything exciting or newsworthy comes out, we will do a fall break news recap episode. But most importantly and most excitingly, most exciting, I don't know what word that is, um, Catherine and I are doing kind of an F101 series, but it's the genealogy series. So going through all of the teams, where they started, when they started, how they've changed hands, and how we have the grid of day some of them are a lot more intricate and exciting than others but we're gonna cover all of them i think it's really cool to like understand the evolution of all of these teams and how they who they've changed hands with and the different names different things like that so we will have that series coming out we decided to do a series because obviously we talk way too much and doing all 10 teams in one episode is just way too much so we'll so have long. i think like three or four episodes depending on how long it takes us to record so look forward to that to keep you you know busy and listening to the going off track podcast during the fall break but until then that is it for our singapore grand prix recap so thanks for going off track with us guys <laughs>